Chair, President and CEO of the Boulder Chamber, and I welcome you to this important Lunch and Learn at Home series event, which is going to help us all understand what we can do to protect our employees and our businesses during this challenging time, um, mitigating those liabilities and risks during this reopening period. Um, before we get started, though, I just wanted to offer just a couple of bits of information about other resources that you can access through the Boulder Chamber. First of all, we have our website at boulderchamber.com slash COVID-19. That is the center for business information resources for everything for your business operating parameters, what you can do in terms of checklists and, and public health protection, as well as what to do to support your employees, your workforce during this time. So I wanna make sure you think about that as an important resource for you. One of the things that you're gonna find on that website is information about the series of education sessions that we will have by industry. So industry specific sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays for every week now going forward for the foreseeable future to update your businesses and your industries on operating parameters, lessons learned, and to share information on best practices. So urge you to check out those education sessions Tuesdays and Thursdays in for your industry and consider joining those. And we also note that we have special Spanish language training and education sessions um, on Wednesdays of every week. So for those Spanish language um, business, uh, business owners and workforce, we encourage you to check out those on Wednesdays. And then finally, just to make sure you also are aware, we have our other information from the past education sessions available on the website. So make sure to go check out those education sessions, which give you step-by-step -step, uh, public health protection uh, uh, initiatives that you can take at your business to protect your workforce and your employees. And then finally, I always wanna make a pitch for our Small Business Relief Fund. That is our funding initiative to support small businesses with grant grants of up to $2,500. And we've been able to meet most of or significant number of the application requests. But if you happen to have additional resources to contribute in support of our small businesses, please check out that opportunity at the Boulder Chamber website. So enough from me. I wanna turn it now over to our panel to, to uh, walk us through um, this mitigating liability and risk in a reopening economy. We know this is an important subject for all of our businesses um, to make sure that they are stable during this period and protecting themselves against um, potential liability issues. So I'm gonna hand it over to Corinne Waldau, um, who's our Economic Development Director, and take it from here, Corinne, thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Welcome to our today's Lunch and Learn at Home series, Mitigating Liability and Risk in a Reopening Economy. We'll be getting to our panel in just a minute, but I just want you to know that today we'll be covering the law, HR, and insurance aspects. And Q&A will be taken through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We'll be doing Q&A at the end of all three speakers. At this time, I'm going to introduce our first speaker or our panelists. We have today Josh Marks, a partner with Burkhill Greenleaf for Nushidi. Laura Woods, the Information Services Manager for the Employers Council, and Matt Honia, Commercial Insurance Advisor from Taggart Insurance. Our first speaker is Josh Marks, who has over 25 years experience in employer law and is a partner at Berg Hill Greenleaf and Ushidi. Yeah, thank you, Corinne. This is uh, my first chance to speak with the Chamber as a whole. Um, over here at Berg Hill, uh, I am the co-chair of our employment practices group, and I also do a tremendous amount of uh, civil litigation in general. Um, our firm has been, since, since the outset of the pandemic, been 
uh, consistently consulting with private and public sector clients over a wide variety of issues involving this pandemic, including uh, the PPP funding, the workforce, workforce reduction issues, and now reopening issues. So uh, I think, um, you know, my insights are uh, hopefully are helpful to everyone and, and it comes from some of the things uh, that we're hearing and some of the advice that we're giving to folks out in, in our world. Um, and, and the main question that I'm getting from clients is, um, what am I opening myself up to by reopening my business or my place of employment back up to employees? Um, and when I'm talking about legal liability for purposes of this, I'm really talking about um, monetary damages and, and civil lawsuits that might arise from your business operations or your or workplace opening events. Um, and I, I don't want to get into, because uh, I don't have enough time, uh, criminal liability that might result or uh, other kinds of enforcement actions that could result from violation of public health orders. That's all that that is related, but I'm really sticking to monetary damage exposure for businesses. And when you're asking, well, what, what are my, uh, ex, what's my exposure here? It's a broad question. And I want to try to divide it up into more bite-sized uh, segments. And I want to break it down into what we're likely to see in terms of state law claims that could arise from reopening and then federal law claims. So let me start with at least the, the state law side of this. Um, mostly what we're gonna see, what we could see are negligence claims uh, arising out of opening up your workplace or your business. Now, the good news is uh, you're not gonna see in negligence cases from your employees because under Colorado law uh, that employers are immune from liability from negligence claims and, and perhaps just about all other claims from your employees because as you may recall from some of our uh, impeachment hearing, uh, the, the, the concept of quid pro quo exists here that our state's workers' compensation system um, provides no fault insurance for employees who get injured uh, from physical injuries and from occupational disease. And so they're entitled to those benefits, whether it's their fault or not. But in exchange, the quid pro quo is that they can't sue employers for negligence. Um, so um, while, while that provides something of a safe harbor, the problem is uh, employers and businesses that open up um, are still gonna face liability from uh, customers who come into their offices, um, vendors who might come in, um, and, and other third parties such as uh, family members of employees if uh, infections get spread as a result of their operations. So what does that mean and what does that look like? Um, is, is kind of the next question that I, I want to answer. Um, and uh, as you might imagine, uh, trying to answer that question in this environment is, is or requires a fair amount of prognosticating at this point because, um, you know, there aren't any actions that really have been filed. There's no published decisions. Our courts go slowly in terms of announcing these things. But I have some ideas and uh, I want to talk through those with you. Um, so with respect to the kinds of negligence claims that we might see, and, and negligence involves usually uh, a duty to depart. Well, it's, it's a legal duty that you have with someone else and it involves departure from uh, a standard of reasonableness or a standard of care. And so what we could, what you could see is customer or, or family member lawsuits for folks who get infected who, or believe they've gotten infected through your workplace. Um, and 
So the, the issue is, what do I do to be reasonable under these circumstances? And while we don't have court rulings yet on this, uh, because the core concept that you're looking at is unreasonable behavior, it is best, the safest harbor to be in at this point is compliance with your state and local public health orders and guidances um, and the CDC guidances that are out there, at least for the workplace um, and, and for business and best business practices which includes, and I'm not gonna get into too much detail because Laura is gonna get into some of this detail uh, that exists under the public health orders and best practices. Um, but th there's an awful lot of resources that are out there, including uh, in Boulder County, um, in terms of checklists and things that this chamber has shared with, with folks. All of those, I think, are will provide some safe harbor in terms of business owners, landowners who are gonna be um, using best practices. Um, these lawsuits are gonna have some issues with them. One of them is gonna be, um, how do you prove causation? Which is gonna be quite a challenge for employees and customers who bring claims, especially when we have asymptomatic transmission. Right now we have poor testing and poor, poor um, uh, contact tracing methodologies. Uh, so that's going to be an issue. Um, the third thing is going to be uh, whether courts have still have to define whether businesses are going to have a legal duty to third parties. Uh, courts do define that businesses have legal duties to people who come into their work environments such as you know customers and those kinds of things. But uh, for example, if you're a business owner, do you have a legal duty to a family member of your employee? Those are the kinds of things that courts are going to have to hash out in the years to come as we see these lawsuits. The final thing I will mention is um, the courts are going to have to wrestle with what kind of dangers do we have to protect against and are we going to get sued under? Uh, I think it's clear that if there's a known danger uh, to a business to, to a, or, or to a workplace or to a landowner, the courts are going to require reasonable measures be uh, undertaken to ensure that that infection doesn't get spread. What's less certain, however, is what do you do with when there's not an actual event of transmission, there's no known evidence that there's uh, any virus in the environment and someone, a customer or a third party uh, happens to be able to prove that they got it at your business. Uh, it's, this is gonna be an area that the courts are gonna have to um, wade into. I don't think there's any clear cut answers at this point, but the safest place to be right now is, again, to follow those uh, existing guidances that I just talked about. I wanna briefly go to um, federal law. Uh, federal law isn't gonna necessarily help define how businesses treat their customers or third parties. Federal law is, it applies and principally is focused on the employment relationship. Um, and for example, uh, let me give you one place where we know federal law is gonna exist. Under our state public health orders, uh, if you're opening up your business, uh, the state un under the current public health order as amended requires temperature taking and symptoms or symptom inquiries by employers. That information implicates the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act directly because those are health exams or considered health exams by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that information has to be both conveyed and the records kept in a confidential way. So we know, for example, here's, here's a great example of an interplay between state law and, and federal law that absolutely applies right now. We also are gonna see situations um, where you have employees uh, who may not wanna come back to work, um, who may not be vulnerable individuals right now, but still have 
disabilities considered by the ADA and may request some reasonable accommodations such that they want to stay home. And, and under the ADA, that may be a disability discrimination claim if employers fail to interact with the employee and provide reasonable accommodations under the law. Federal law also applies with respect to some of the leave requests that are being, that the, or the expanded leave that's been created by the FFRCA, which is the Family First um, Coronavirus Relief Act. Um, and Laura's gonna talk a little bit about those, but uh, we are likely to see more claims by people who get leave requests denied or may get terminated following making those leave requests. So that's an area that, that I, I think we're likely to see in the future. Uh, the other area that uh, we need to monitor is OSHA, uh, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA applies to all workplace environments. It currently does not have administrative standards specific to COVID-19 administration. Uh, it's likely to provide some uh, standards, especially, and, and some people are, are looking to OSHA's ventilation standards. Um, so that's another area that, while, while it doesn't result in monetary damage, but it could also provide some safe harbor in terms of standardized practice here. So let's talk about the takeaways at the end of, from all this. You know, there's an incredible amount of uncertainty in the legal and regulatory landscape there, the, the laws and the public health orders are changing very dramatically at this point. And it requires both employers, business owners to be flexible and nimble in dealing with employment issues and practices and practices dealing with your customers. It's going to require that, that you either pair up with or undertake periodic updates to these legal sources to keep your knowledge base current. Um, thank you for letting me talk with you. I'll be around for the question and answer period and I'm gonna uh, hand this off to Laura. Thanks Josh, great insights on the legal framework. At this time, we're gonna welcome our next speaker who is Laura Woods. She is the Information Services Manager at the Employers Council, Council and has been there since 2007. She'll talk to you a little bit more about the HR side. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I, I appreciate you guys having me here. It's nice to, um, nice to be here. Let me share my screen and make sure I've got that going. All right. And um, we had a few questions, I think, that we just kind of wanted to go through and talk to you folks about today. And so I just, I put together a few slides. And I think the first question that we get a lot is, what about employees who don't feel safe returning to work? So as I'm opening up my work, um, I'm trying to bring people back to work. Um, we've got people who say, I don't want to come back. I'm not comfortable yet. I don't feel safe. And the first question that we ask is, are they an identified vulnerable population? Are they part of that vulnerable population? Um, this is a short list, the CDC and also the Colorado Safer at Home um, statutes that you can read um, have a longer list, but these tend to be sort of the, the higher up there. People 65 years or older, uh, people who live in long-term care, um, people with underlying medical conditions. Those are usually longer heart conditions, um, including and in diabetes, um, just something that would make your body or immune system weaker. Um, those are under the Colorado Safer at Home, the vulnerable populations do need to be accommodated in a way maybe you can continue to let them work from home if that's not an option or you're not a home work environment, um, there might be other conversations. I do wanna talk a little bit about what Josh said because one of the things that we're seeing is not only um, people being not having the ADA interactive conversation, but other employers are wanting to exclude people um, from a vulnerable population to say, I don't want you to come in because you're at risk. And that's actually not okay also under the ADA. So it's really important to make sure that you are involved in that interactive process, that you're having a conversation around any of those disabilities or vulnerabilities. If they're not in a vulnerable um, community or if they're not, you know, can they continue to work from home for those who want it and those who can? 
Um, and finally, um, if you have a benefits program, a health benefits program, something like that, most of them come with what's called an employer assistance program or an EAP. And the EAPs are really good references for people who may be having um, grief issues or anxiety issues or, or some of the things that might be happening around coming back from to work. And if you can refer them to the EAP, um, generally that's private between the employee and the, and the provider. So you don't get involved. So you can let them know that that's anonymous. And um, maybe that will help them have somebody to talk to about coming back to work um, and coming back to work for you. So that's one thing to think about. Um, another question that we get a lot, and I think this is one to address, is what about employees who refuse to come back to work um, because they actually, maybe they're making more on unemployment or um, I know of people who are just happy not to have to be homeschooling and working, so unemployment's working well for them because they only have to focus on the one. Um, it's really, really important to remember that most states, including Colorado, have very strict guidelines about um, employees who refuse available work. And in Colorado, we are legally required to report people who refuse available work. And so, um, and you can do that through some forms online. There's a questionnaire that you can fill out on the Colorado State. Um, having said that, it kind of goes back to the previous slide of, they may have a legitimate reason not to return to work. And if you think it's because they're refusing it because of unemployment, you can make that report. They'll do an investigation is what they'll do. And then they'll determine color, the state of Colorado, whether or not this is someone who legitimately can continue on unemployment. Um, so what I've told people that I've spoken to, our members, our clients, is that the hard line on this, the really hard line on this is that under the unemployment laws, um, if you refuse to come back to available work um, and there's no sort of underlying reason for that, then they will probably also lose unemployment. And that is something to really consider. I've had employers and members ask me, well, but if I wanna be compassionate, can I just not report that they refuse to come to work? You can do anything you want. Um, that's a certain, certainly a risk assessment that you need to take because again, under the law, you really are required to report that people refused um, available work. So that is something to think about as well. Um, one thing you can think about if you need to is partnering with the state of Colorado about the work share program. There are some things around the work share program that offer um, a, a reduction in hours or a partial reduction in hours that allows people to continue to get the unemployment and continue to work. And it's a, it's a pretty good program. There's some very specific parameters around it, but I think it's a, if you have people who are refusing to come back, you might want to explore partnering with Colorado on the work share program as well. Um, so that's something to think about. Employees who can't return to work because of childcare. This is another really big topic. Um, it's something that's really, it's huge. And it goes back to, again, can they work from home? I understand there's a ton of employers out there that have, you know, you are not work from home employers. You're not office employee employers. You don't have office employees. And so that may not be an option, but that's always our first question. The next question is, do you qualify for um, the tax breaks under the FFCRA, which is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act? Josh brought that up earlier. There are several types of leaves available, um, paid leaves available to employees and employers who cannot work because of childcare. Um, I think the legal language around it is you can't work or telework because you need to stay home because there's no childcare or school available. Um, and the, uh, it basically there's a, there's a sick time or an expanded FMLA for employers and um, you get a tax break if you do this. Um, I recommend that you partner with a tax attorney or a CPA or a tax expert um, or a loan expert around these. You can certainly call um, your legal counsel as well, just to make sure that you are going to get the credits back because you have to do it correctly. But that allows for 12 weeks of leave um, under the FFCRA, at least fully paid or partially paid, um, and the employer gets reimbursed for most of that. So that's something to think about. If that's not an option, um, for whatever reason, you also wanna take a look at if they have any PTO, sick or vacation time that you can let them use, 
choose to stay home with kids, um, if you are willing to give them an unpaid leave with the potential of coming back or reapplying for a job, um, any of those options that you can look at to keep your employees. Um, I, it's one that I thought of after I made this slide also was making sure um, if you are eligible for the Paycheck Protection program under the CARES Act, you might be able to keep those folks on again part-time and maybe they can create some, some child care um, parameters around that as well. So um, hopefully that sort of addresses that problem and that issue. The next sort of bucket of things that we've talked about and that we've learned about is what do I do? So if I open up, what do I do if I have an employee who tests positive? What do I do if I have an employee who says I've been exposed or I'm symptomatic? So there are several sorts of things that you can do. The first thing you need to do is, is send that infected employee home. Um, under the Colorado Safer at Home Act, um, where people are starting to come back into the offices, we have 50% of people coming back into the offices. Um, there is a requirement that you test for temperatures and symptoms um, as people come in. If you have 50 or more employees, there are some um, structure or infrastructure requirements, and I think that's on my next slide, so we'll talk about that. But if you have an infected employee or somebody who's symptomatic, you have to send them home. You have to ask them to stay home for 14 days and as long as it takes for the symptoms to disappear. So even if it's been 14 days, if they're still coughing, they still have a fever, they need to stay home. Um, you can require people to stay home or quarantine if they've been exposed, um, regardless of the symptoms or the test results. That is okay under some of the, under the, those new acts. You wanna make sure um, that employees are also calling their healthcare provider, right? And make sure that they stay safe. So that's just sort of a, a compassionate thing to do. Um, it goes again back to, do you need to provide sick leave? There are two laws that sort of interact. There's a Colorado law called the HELP leave law, and that provides for um, paid time off for somebody who's waiting for a test result, for somebody who has been um, diagnosed, and for somebody who's quarantining. And that's, I believe, 80 hours or two weeks of pay under the Colorado Health Act. And then in the federal acts, um, the FFCRA, there's the expanded sick leave again, and the expanded, the, um, the expanded sick leave may also cover or be in addition to that HELP Act. So those are things to think about. Um, you need to inform other employees that there's been an exposure in the workplace. And this is really tricky, and Josh touched on this earlier. You need to let people know that there's been an exposure and you need to be very, very careful not to tell everybody who it was. So names, um, all of that private information around that exposure needs to be private, but you need to be able to tell people there's been an exposure, it's been in this department or this area, you know, keep an eye out for symptoms. Let us know if you become symptomatic, you'll need to, to send home. And then you might wanna go onto the CDC website, take a look at their cleaning protocols um, and around that. And if you need to hire somebody to clean for those protocols, or if you have a cleaning crew or you can do it yourself, um, some of those sick and pandemic protocols, you wanna make sure that you're cleaning for those. Some of the other safety protocols, some of, and I think that actually this goes back to employees who are, um, not feeling safe coming back. One of the other ways that you can make people, people feel safe coming back is make sure that they understand that you are complying with the protocols that, and that you communicate that really well. Um, Boulder County, um, the Boulder Chamber has return to work checklists by industry. They're really helpful and I think they can help you with um, making sure that you're creating those protocols. Again, you have to implement symptom monitoring pro protocols including temperature monitoring where possible. That's an important language there. So you have to, you know, um, you can allow your employees to self-check and self-check symptoms. Um, and it's probably a good idea to track that, have a tracking system um, or a checklist so that people, as they are checking their own symptoms, um, can write that down so that you can keep that for your records. And again, it's, you know, once they have a fever or have those symptoms, you're going to want them to report that to you and go back to those action steps. Um, if you have 50 or more employees, you have to implement those protocols by either setting up a, like a symptom screening station at the work site or create a policy that talks about those self-screening checks or those day checks. And so that's, it's 
it's a little bit confusing in the language um, and what we have come to and what we're advising our members is that all employers have to have the symptom monitoring, but you only have to put this infrastructure around it if you have 50 or more employees. Um, so that was one of the one of the questions that came up earlier. Um, and then, you know, finally, I just want to talk about some more safety protocols. You want to talk about having really good policies and communicating them. You want to talk about hygiene and hygiene policies, hand washing policies. Um, your social distancing policies, how do things stay away? Your physical environment, you know, if you don't own your building or if you rent your building, do you have to change the way the offices are set up or the or the cubes are set up? Um, the bathrooms, you know, whose responsibility is it to wipe down a bathroom after somebody's used it? Um, one of the things that came up in another webinar that I was a part of is even just doorways, entrances and exits of um, bathrooms or meeting rooms. You know, is that a really narrow space where it's going to funnel people in and you have to kind of pile on top of each other to get into a space in within your office or within your work site? And if that's the case, how are you going to manage that? How are you going to manage the social, social distancing requirements? Um, things like break rooms, shared spaces, um, cabinet doors, cabinets, um, refrigerators, microwave, chairs, tables, um, how are you going to monitor those as well? If you have the option, some of the ways that you can implement some of those safety protocols as well is to do some alternative scheduling. Like, uh, again, <laughs> hopefully I've said that enough, I'm sorry, provide a remote work often, option. Um, there's another if you want to stagger shifts, if you want to stagger lunch and break periods, um, things like that, if that's an option that can help as well. And then again, just know your local rules, know the Boulder um, face covering order because it is its own order um, and it, you can find it on the website. Um, and then the Colorado Safer at Home rules as we start to relax those workplaces. So that's everything I have. I don't know if I used my whole time or too much. I hope that's okay. I'm happy okay. to pass it on. Thank you, Laura. We already have a bunch of questions coming in for you. So at, at the end of Matt's program, we'll, we'll do the question and answer. And as a reminder, please put the questions in the Q&A feature. It's just a lot easier to manage that way. At this time, I'm going to introduce our final speaker, and that's Matt Honey, with, who's a commercial insurance advisor with Taggart Insurance, which is a longstanding Boulder insurance provider. They've been with us for over 80 years. Uh, Matt's going to talk a little bit about the insurance side of this and the risk and mitigating risk in that area. Take it away, Matt. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, obviously we've got several insurance implications when you start thinking about uh, the crazy times that we're going through here with COVID. Um, and so I'm going to just kind of follow up on, on our previous speakers and, and talk about specific coverages that may be impacted, as well as some changes that, that you may want to make um, to reflect what's going on. And so the, the areas that uh, we're going to focus on uh, are basically employers liability, general liability, employment practices liability, and then the cyber risk. On the, on the employer's liability piece, um, Josh uh, described one potential liability situation earlier that involved uh, an employee getting sick potentially while at work and then going home and getting his family sick. And that, that's a situation, as Josh explained, that the, the employee's injury or illness is covered by workers' compensation. It's the sole remedy available uh, to that employee. However, it does not apply to those family members that may have uh, been infected vicariously through his, his or her employment. And that's where employer's liability come, comes into play. And, this is an area of coverage that traditionally we had very few claims in and we're expecting um, in the near future to start seeing some of these again and it, it's part of your traditional work comp policy that is actually separate from work comp and it's gonna it's gonna apply in the event you're sued by a third party due to it, an employment situation. And a couple of the, the ones that do come up is our loss of consortium. If a, if a spouse loses 
uh, their husband or wife um, ensues. Uh, secondly, another frequent one is is consequential bodily injury, and that would be the situation where an employee goes home and gets the rest of the family sick. In the uh, so Pinnacle uh, writes most of our work comp here in Colorado, um, and. The standard limits, if you just went to Pinnacle and got a work comp policy, they're going to give you a hundred uh, hundred grand per injury and a five hundred thousand dollar aggregate for the twelve month policy period for all disease. And th this is one that I I would highly recommend checking to everybody. Um, you can increase these limits pretty easily to a million dollars a piece. The cost to do so is 1.1% of total premium. So if you've got a $10,000 policy, the cost to raise these to a million bucks is gonna be $110. So it's a very marginal cost compared to, to what you end up with. Um, the second piece that I'd recommend everybody looking at is the umbrella. So your commercial umbrella, you have the ability to schedule employer's liability is an underlying coverage on the policy, which will enable the, your umbrella limits to support uh, the employer's liability in the event that those limits were to be exhausted. Generally, there's no charge for doing that. It's just a matter of, of contacting your agent or carrier and requesting that, that the employer's liability is added to the underlying policy. And this is what it would actually look at look like. Um, an easy way to, to check this is just pull your umbrella policy and you're gonna wanna see the underlying schedule of insurance. You'll want employer's liability listed. And as I said, it's, it's generally free to add. So it, it's, it, given current times, it would be a good idea to at least check and, and see what you've got now. The other piece that Josh touched on is the potential liability to uh, customers or vendors or guests. Um, and on this piece, uh, we get a lot of questions about whether or not general liability policies will respond uh, to those lawsuits for people claiming that they contracted COVID uh, due to your negligence. Um, and failure to keep them safe. And for the most part, the good news is that we believe the answer is yes. Uh, most general liability policies will respond. Coverage is there. And um, it, we aren't expecting to have coverage issues from a general liability perspective. The one Exception to this is there are a small number of policies out there that have a communicable disease exclusion. And I've got it here on the next slide. Um, this could be an issue. Um, as I said, it's, I don't think it's very prevalent, but it's definitely in the industry. This is uh, an exclusion that it's probably worth checking on your current policies to see if you have it. If you don't have it, chances are, uh, in our opinion, you're not going to have coverage issues in the event you're a third party brings suit for contracting COVID or anything related to that. Another area that we're anticipating a uh, high number of claims in the near future is employment practices liability. And a lot of you probably have these policies in place now or have them combined with your directors and officers or your general liability policies. Um, it is, uh, as Laura was talking about, with the new regulations we've got potentially federal and state guidelines that, that employers are, are having to not only follow, but since they're changing basically every day, um, you have to keep up with them. And we believe that that is gonna open up a lot of employers to, to lawsuits from employees claiming that, that they were wrong, wrongfully terminated, uh, discriminated against, um, 
also it, potential privacy claims when when employers are collecting the temperature readings and um, asking the employees uh, health related questions uh, that information potentially um, could be considered private and as it, as Josh said um, is likely going to uh, fall into ADA compliance in the event that um, that, that that material was to be compromised or uh, suits came out of uh, sharing information with, with other employees. Um, employment practices is where we're going to be looking to, to cover those claims. And I think more than ever, employment practices liability is something that we want um, everybody to have at least, at least a, a minimal policy in place. The defense costs are, are typically um, a bulk of these claims. And most of these policies are very broad and are going to provide coverage for the scenario scenarios that we anticipate uh, coming out of COVID. And one area that, that didn't really tie into Josh and Laura as much, but I, I wanted to mention it because we have seen a large increase in claims in this area is the the cyber liability and, and cyber risk. Um, there's a combination of factors here. Uh, number one, we've got a lot of people working remotely. We have a lot of uh, new technology being utilized uh, in the work workplace. And what it's done is open up a lot of opportunities for hackers uh, to get into systems install malware, um, lock up systems, and, and um, require a, a, a payment to open them up. Uh, we've also seen uh, some financial type fraud um, in the form of phishing scams that uh, have been a little more successful when, when the remote employees are outside of their normal firewalls within the office. And then lastly, tying into the, the privacy piece on the, the information we're, we're gonna be collecting from, from employees, um, like the temperature readings, it, depending on how that stuff is stored, if it were to be compromised, you could have some notification requirements um, as well as, as fines and penalties uh, from the various uh, regulations that may be applicable. Uh, cyber is where we would would look to, to respond to those breaches. And in a lot of cases, we're gonna have some coverage for um, actually rep representation to the compliance bureaus and, and working with you through that process. And yeah, I think every industry uh, has been uh, severely changed or impacted by, by COVID. Uh, Insurance obviously is, is, is no different. Um, I think we're looking at some pretty big changes on this front. First of all, I, I think that the, your current policies uh, are gonna likely have some, some new exclusions on them uh, at the next renewal. One being that, that communicable disease exclusion that I showed earlier, I, I expect those to be more common uh, moving forward. We haven't seen them yet. And it, honestly, I'm a little surprised we haven't, but most of the consultants that we're talking to are expecting that to, to be on the horizon. We're also expecting significant increases to rates on directors and officers, employment practices and cyber policies. And uh, on my slide, I mentioned a hardening of the market and, and, from an insurance perspective, when we look at that, the other thing that it means is there's there's less options for coverage, um, and the coverage that, that we're able to obtain is generally more restrictive. So more expensive, more restrictive um, is definitely not not what we're looking for, but I, I think we can expect it over the next couple of years. Uh, the last question um, that I wanted to, to address is we've gotten a lot of questions and, and calls 
um, with people that, that, that are curious as to whether or not there was a product they could have purchased before the pandemic that would have provided some sort of business interruption, um, loss of revenue coverage. And the second question we get is, is there something I can purchase moving forward? And the answer to, to both generally is no. Um, the, uh, Previously, there were some 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 policies out there offered by Lloyd's of London type companies, and typically for the the middle market or small business, uh, it just didn't make sense from a premium perspective. And I think that a lot of us uh, never thought that something like this would ever happen as well. So it uh, wasn't something that that was widely purchased nor pr provided. Um, we, we are hearing there's a number of carriers that are currently working on pandemic type policies. Uh, I would expect by the end of the year, we're gonna have some options. I don't know what the cost is gonna be, what the coverage will look like. It'll likely come from the overseas Lloyds of London type outfits. But in general, I, I, I think somebody's gonna come to the table and have something. Um, it's just a question of, of whether or not it's it's cost prohibitive to to utilize it. Uh, and that's all I had for for to, for today. So I'll uh, turn it back over here and uh, let's answer some questions. Thank you. You stop sharing your screen. We're going to see all the speakers um, for question and answer. We have quite a few questions, and so we'll try to get through as many as we can uh, with our speakers today. Uh, so, Laura, I think uh, the first couple are free for you, and Josh, please please chime in if um, if this is something that's on the legal side that you'd like to answer. Sure. But first, is there a size limitation for employers subject to employees refusing to return to work? Are there any size limitations to some of that you talked about? No. If you pay into unemployment insurance, you are um, you are responsible for adhering to their rules. Okay. How do you avoid telling who was exposed if you only have a few employees and it's quite obvious? That, that's a really good question. Um, the ADA only requires that the employer not disclose the, the source. And, and so if employees can figure it out, that's okay, but the employer shouldn't confirm it. And so, so, so long as the employer isn't kind of, you know, um, complicit in disseminating who who was the infected person, you're going to be okay under the ADA. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Do you have anything else you want to add or is that covered? I 100% agree. <laughs> All right. Uh, so would you suggest that we produce an offer letter to formalize the available hours to return to work? Is this what needs to happen to dispute UI claims? I, I can defer to Josh a little bit. I mean, we, we, I think that you can, if you want to, our, our advice is always consistency and make sure that you're not making too many promises, right? So if you're going to create an offer letter, it's going to be the same as any other offer letter with a new employee is you don't want to put anything in it that um, implies that this is permanent employment, that they'll never lose their job there. You know, there has to be a lot of sort of um, employer at will kind of language in it. And I think it's important for the record keeping that you do have that offer and maybe even that refusal if you can get it. Josh, I, how do you? Yeah, I think it's a, it's kind of a Pandora's box. You, you, you don't want the offer letter, letter to be so specific that it can actually bind the employer right. as to here, you know, and, and have an employee come back later on and say, well, you contractually offered me this minimum amount because things are going right. to change. So, that that's the tension. I it's 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 not. I think there's a way to do an offer letter without including all the detail that could create problems for an employer down the line. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, a question. Two questions for you, Matt. Two insurance questions. Um, if you get confronted with pandemic-related exclusion, should we push back on the insurance company? Yes. I I would say for the the policies current currently in place, if you you already renewed and you've got it on your policy, uh, you're not gonna be able to change that. You're, you're gonna be stuck with it for the, the current policy period. But if it appears on your renewal and um, 
the insurance company has has placed it on there for the first time, I would highly encourage everybody to push back on it. Um, it w at this point, we just don't know how prevalent those exclusions are going to be. And if it's going to be industry specific or, or across the board. So uh, anytime you see that, I, I think you always want to push back and, and I just can't, I can't predict what the alternatives might be, but uh, it's worth at least asking. And another one for you, how do we rec how do you recommend we proceed with cyber coverage if we don't already have it? Uh, if you don't have cyber, uh, I, we'd be happy to help you with it. Uh, we have a small business department here um, that can rate them usually same day online. Uh, the coverage for the most part is pretty inexpensive and easy to bind. I, I think that'll change. Um, in the near future, but but, but right now, if, if they want to give us a call, we can certainly uh, provide some quotes. Okay, I think this one's kind of the HR legal. Uh, for those employees working with vulnerable populations in group homes, for example, can we make them quarantine if they are not abiding by safer at home during their off time, like wearing a mask, social distancing, not doing it, doing essential travel only? So that is another Pandora's box. And I, I think Josh will probably have more to say about that. But to me, my question that from the HR side is an administrative issue. How are you going to know that? How are you going to police it? And how are you going to enforce it uniformly? Because you can't, if you, you can't pick and choose who gets um, in trouble for not wearing a mask somewhere, right? These all, consistency is always important when it comes to being able to defend your decision making. And if you cannot enforce something like that consistently, then no. And I think that's what the symptom screening is for, is to sort of help that as somebody's on their way into the office. I, Josh, I defer to you and what you would say. Um, well, for one, it's obviously a big ask to right. make employees. And, um, but uh, we know that folks in, you know, it, it, that are on the front lines of this, you know, doctors, nurses um, are doing it and, and, and are quarantining in, in a very much more restrictive way than, than what this question contemplates. So I think possibly it can be done. I would like to, I, I would hope it'd be kind of done as a last resort in terms of, you know, um, uh, first I, I'd be requesting that the employee do everything themselves, you know, to do the right things to keep themselves healthy. If they won't answer an employee, employer's question and symptom questions about it, um, you know, I think then the employer can say, uh, that they have the ability to say, look, you you can't come into the workplace unless you give us this information and we're comfortable that you're not, you know, you're, you're not asymptomatic and, and you're not being reckless. Um, but uh, again, it's, it, it's going into an area that previously um, employers have not had to go into in terms of regulating someone's private life. So I, I, it, it's, it's hard to give a standard yes or no on this one. I think we're, we have a lot of Pandora's boxes here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so speaking of temperature readings, what's the proper way to record a temperature reading? Can you have a log that other people see or do you need to keep it private? Private. Or <laughs> I'm going to go with private. If you really don't want to have a log where somebody writes their name down and then writes down their, their screening symptoms. Um, there's actually, and I can show my screen because I pulled it up, but on the Colorado um, website, on the uh, Department of Health website, there is um, a whole list of how to conduct the screening. And there's a sample template that you can use and take. Um, and you can also tweak it to use it for self-screening as well. Um, and I would make sure, again, that the names aren't on it. That's private health information. Um, and so Can you have a singular COVID coordinator, for example, that has access yeah. like your HR person? Yes, and we're actually recommending it, um, that that is one of the ways to bring people back um, to work is to have somebody who is responsible for all of that kind of back to work sort of thing. And those could be the same people that you send your self check in the morning 
to before you come to the work. Right. The work. And the nice thing about having that centralized is you don't have to train all your line managers or your supervisors or anything on all that privacy. That's just one person who's responsible for taking care of all of that. Okay. Yeah. The, the other thing is, you know, if, if you have a standard start of work time, you're going to have a lot of employees kind of waiting to, to yeah. give temperatures and give symptom information. You want to try to disperse that so so it doesn't happen. So other employees aren't, you know, in the proximity of the employee giving those answers out. So so you want to find a way either, you know, maybe um, to, to have a separate room, ask your employees to come come down at different times, start at some at different times, or or wait in a different room if you can do it um, to avoid that. And Laura, just to clarify what you were talking about, the 50 or over, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they don't have to do screenings, but it just means it's, it's where you need to set up an infrastructure where Correct. they come in and get screened on site yes. um, and so forth. Yes, now, that is exactly right. Now, Boulder County Public Health has been using the number 25 for a lot of companies um, because some of the rules, but you know, it, either way, you need to have some sort of infrastructure to be able to collect temperature readings and Correct. symptom checks. Yes. Okay, this is a little off the HR side, but what's the responsibility of an accommodations provider or any personal service or service provider to notify other guests if someone either staying there or has come, has come in and used your service has been exposed or comes down with symptoms? Hmm. So this is on the customer side. What's your responsibility as a business to alert others of, of someone being exposed or um, having COVID? That might be an insurance question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can do some research. We don't, we don't do the customer side as much at the employer's council. We do the employee side. So I'm not sure I can wisely answer that. I don't know about. I think it was more for Josh on that one. Yeah, well, Fair enough. I, I mean, it's, to me, it's almost a, a, a politics i mean it's it, it's a political question almost uh, do you want to be the employer or, or the business that isn't helping out the community at large if you know that there was an infected person that that came into your you know came into your facility uh, I, I think if if you get wind of that information um you, you know, you definitely want to try to cooperate with folks who may be involved in contact tracing or, or, or your other customers who might have come in to let them know you had that exposure. Uh, I think it's just a good practice at this point to, to be a good to be a good neighbor in this environment more than anything. I'm not so sure it's a legal requirement. And one of the things that Boulder County Public Health and other public health in the state have are ways that you need to record, you know, you're, the people you're providing service to. And in some cases, in some industries, you have to do symptom checks of them as well. So there are ways to record that so you can do a little bit of your own contact tracing internally. Manufacturers are also suggesting any, anybody coming in <laughs> to your business, should um, you should have a record of that. Well, it, and as a follow-up, certainly if, if you get wind that you had a customer who was infected who came in for your business, I think at a minimum, the, the guidelines require you to have, to do a deep clean to wherever they may have been in a public area. Okay, we have uh, probably two more questions. One of them is a little bit about, uh, I've gotten, we've gotten wind of people having, you know, either guests or employees or whatever sign releases, releasing from them, saying that they're following uh, protocols, that they're not going to hold the company liable. Is that an effective tool? Is that something that more businesses are going to be doing? Um, I'm happy to answer. Start, start <laughs> trying to answer that. You know, most of the collective wisdom of the uh, of the you know lawyer groups, at least on the defense side, it is that these releases are are probably not a good idea. Um, under the circumstances that it's, 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 I mean, you, especially when you're talking about employees that, you know, employers are, should document what they're doing to protect employees. 
at, at a minimum in terms of what their program is. But to make an employee come in and acknowledge that the employer is doing all this and they'll release them from all these claims se seems to go a little bit too far. And, and I think it might even be kind of coercive and, and, and the release may not be valid down the road. What we've been saying also is that you have to think about OSHA. Under OSHA, you have an obligation to provide a safe working environment. And there's no release. You can't, you can't coerce your employees to release you from that law and from that obligation. And so that might be another issue around some of those releases. How about customers, though? Uh, let's say you're going into someone's home. Part of your job is going into someone's home. Can you have them sign a release um, saying that they're following precautions or someone that comes into your business, um, can you have them sign a release? I think you can do a symptom check and I think you can let people know, especially at your place of business, that you do symptom checks for everybody coming in the building. Um, in terms of people's homes, I, I don't have an answer again. Um, that's a really rough run. Josh or Matt? And I, I'll let Josh uh, comment on, on the, the legal aspect of it. And what, one comment I did want to make is, is if, if you do end up using any type of release, especially with a third party, uh, you definitely want to get, send that to your insurance carrier and, and make sure that, that, that they've been notified you're going to be using it. And probably your lawyer too at, at this point. Yeah, well, hopefully like. the lawyer is the one that drafted it. So. Okay. Um, yeah. I can see a variation of that where um, if you're going into a third party's residence and you have to provide services to, you know, to, to, for the protection of, if you're a business owner, for the protection of your employees to kind of uh, ask that your client, you know, who's in that facility kind of affirm that what they're doing so that you're not exposing your employee. And, and that's kind of another way to get at the same thing without them signing a release, but just to make them affirm and, and go over with you what they're doing to create, to, to keep their house or, 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 or whatever environment as clean as possible. So you can evaluate whether it's appropriate to set an employee in there or not. Okay, and then what if you have employees that are 65 years who want to work despite being in the vulnerable population, can you tell them that they can't work? No. <laughs> you can ask them. I mean, again, it goes back to the interactive process. You can ask them why. Is there a disability that they need an accommodation for? And if that's the case, you can have that conversation. But to just say, hey, I'm doing this to protect you because you're 65, that butts up against the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. It butts up against the ADA. Um, that's a problem. Yeah. And, and even going back to the public health order itself, the, the language doesn't prohibit someone who's a vulnerable individual from working. It's that they're urging folks in that vulnerable category to stay at home, but it's not a mandate. And so they can come into work, um, but, but um, they're subject to all the other requirements, you know, in the workplace for screening and, and that kind of thing. All right, one last question, then I'm gonna close this out. What about tenants? What if you own a building or rent out spaces um, to multiple tenants? What's your liability? Matt? I, I, <laughs> I'm always hesitant to comment on these things when you have a lawyer involved. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to spread it around so that- uh, Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not um, eager to, or not disappointed uh, to, to answer that one, not answer that one. So I, I would encourage you to, from a legal aspect uh, to go ahead and provide a response. You know, what I, what I would ask is um, if the landlord is responsible for some of the common areas in that situation, you know, the landlord has the obligation to, uh, I think, to have the height clean. It looks like we have a little bit of technical difficulties with Josh. Um, we'll send out, we'll send out, maybe if you could, we could write up a quick thing, we'll send out the answer because it doesn't look like we're able to get that one. Um, 
So we'll try to at least answer that person's question. At this time, I'm actually going to close. We're a little over time, but we had a lot of really great questions. I'm going to thank Josh, Laura, and Matt for joining us today. Um, very valuable information. I know there's a lot of questions still out there. And we want to encourage you to keep asking questions, talk to your lawyers, talk to your um, insurance you know, providers, and talk to individuals like the Employers Council, because we have a lot of Pandora's boxes as came up in today's, um, in today's question and answer. Thank you for attending, for dedicating your time to get answers in this, this very uncertain time. Uh, we'll be sending out materials after this uh, session, and there will be a recording of this session that you can listen or send to others. If you need anything in the meantime, and including lists of future webinars, those industry-specific webinars that John referenced, please go to boulderchamber.com. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you, Josh, Laura, and Matt for your time today. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.